So this this lecture is going to be about paleoseismology of strike slip faults, and we've covered a lot already in the prior lectures. Many examples I've already shown, so I'll I include a few, but I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. So the main places we find strike slip faults are various transforms. So obviously oceanic transforms, but the alpine fault is a connection of two subduction zones that have opposite dip, right? Actually, it goes like the Karangi and like this. Uh, and then there's continental extrusion or indent linked faults, so like the North Anatolian fault or the Alton Tog, as we talked about a few times. There's trans-parallel strikes of faults. One of the most famous is the Great Sumatran fault. And then sometimes the edges of, great, of big landslides will have the strike slip as you go from, you know, the slide to the stable zone on the other side, there, there has to be horizontal motion between them, right? So one of the things about strikes of faults that usually they're, uh, you know, we think of them as mostly having horizontal motion, but they can have some complexity along strike as well as down dip that makes for more uh, complex rupture patterns which we may exploit at times to uh, get a good record of earthquake timing because if the ground is opened up in many places that lets us have a good record. Also, in a place like this, it a, a, would be a depression, so it might be a good target for fault-related sedimentation. You can have this. Uh, another discontinuity, which would be more of a less step or more contractional setting, and we might have lots of, of reverse fault deformation in there. So, strikes of faults are, you know, just like every fault, have some discontinuities, and we can work with these discontinuities to help us at times when we're trenching. So, uh, there's many well studied historical strikes of fault ruptures. And I showed, for example, remember this uh, Denali rupture? I talked about that one. I've talked about Landers. Um, we talked a little bit about the Izmit earthquake when we did uh, uh, Coulomb, but and that whole sequence. And then 1857 is a famous uh, earthquake that we talked about a little bit. So also more. There were these. Uh, Earthquake the Bull Nye. I showed the Fuyun earthquake. Remember this uh, example for uh, kind of characteristic behavior came from there. A new paper actually. This was written before this occurred. So I've discussed already the rupture map from the 1906 earthquake. So we see a very long rupture, 300 kilometers, and the peak is offsets of about eight meters and kind of irregular uh, flip distribution, not quite symmetric. And what, remember, was distinctive about the Denali rupture is that the Denali fault itself continues here, but this earthquake stepped to an adjacent subparallel fault when it ruptured. So this is another problem for segmentation, is we didn't expect that step to occur. We would have planned for the ruptured stay up here on Denali Fault. So that was unusual. So act, active fault traces is kind of the famous picture of tricep fault zones where we have offset stream channels, small ridges along the fault, secondary traces. And I wrote a paper a few years ago just comparing different kinds of mapping along a piece of the San Andreas Fault. So this is just shows uh, kind of USGS mapping from more aerial photography in the field. And then this was one of my students and I mapping only in the field. And this is another student, Zilke, only mapping in the office. So he never went there. And so, we, but on LIDAR. And so just trying to compare, you know, how well can we, what do we get with different data sets and different approaches? So he, he did, Olaf whoops, did pretty well with the mapping, but uh, he, 
you know, he had some of these secondary features that he questioned. And, you know, I agree there's something here. But when we were in the field, we, you know, we just really worked on the main trace and this little step over zone. And these are landslides, this brown here. Uh, and then we had a trench site here that we worked on. And then this was USGS mapping from 30 years earlier. And they identify some of, they name some of these features. So swale is kind of like a low sort of trough along the fault zone, small scarps that are aligned, uh, so on. So um, this was just uh, kind of comparing different styles of mapping. So we've already seen this one. This is, uh, you know, a lot of thinking has gone into how to do large-scale geomorphic offsets. I also showed the Wallace Creek example. And then I showed this example when we did the cosmogenic dating. So remember, we discussed it, the large-scale reconstruction of these geomorphic features uh, and then their dating using cosmogenic methods. I showed this one, so this is in contrast to the sort of slip rate study, which was the last couple. This is a single event offset study by matching features that are very fine uh, drainages on these alluvial fans. And remember this impressive result that they had. So the last several earthquakes, each time showing a multiple of the, pri the, per the prior one. And so they said characteristic slip in this case. So very important and, and, you know, we expect this behavior on all faults, but in some ways it's easier to access this record on strike slip faults because it's moving horizontally. Whereas if it's, if for a dip slip, it's going down, so it's hard to find it. Although remember yesterday I talked to, with the normal faults, we can have these stacked alluvial wedges. And if the wedges are similar in height, it might show characteristic behavior for the normal fault. And then same, if you think for normal faults, if you think of my Palmer case, it looks like those, at least those two were similar in height. The wedges are about the same size. So maybe this is a, a really universal behavior for faults, or it's, you know, it's more complex, but one kind of earthquake we have is a characteristic full rupture event. We may have smaller ones that happen in between them, but they're harder to see in the record. Okay, so here, so these are stratigraphic indicators of paleo earthquakes in strikes of environments in a generic sense. So this is what we're looking for when you say, okay, so what are we supposed to do when we're looking for earthquakes? This is it. So you see almost every time it's an unconformity. So here, for example, the E always means earthquake. So here, there was some earthquake that caused this offset, and then it was buried. And so this is upward termination. So the most common evidence, but you'll see in the next slide, it's not always definitive, because sometimes the faults will terminate at shall below the ground surface. They, they just stop at some interface. Other evidence we can have is a deformed horizon, so especially shallowly, the layers may be unconsolidated, and if you shake them, you get some deformation, but then we bury that deformation. Mm -hmm. Here's a buried scarp here, so we, we have some offset. You see this to this. So we had a scarp. It's eroded, and we get a colluvial package. And so it's important to see exactly where is E. So E represents the ground surface at the time of the earthquake. So sometimes it's called the event horizon. And so all of the sedimentation is after the earthquake. So here, buried scarp and buried scarp, you could say, well, what's the difference? This is a buried scarp that's buried by colluvium. This is a buried scarp that's buried by other sedimentation. So this would maybe be something you would see in the submarine environment where there's uniform sedimentation just blanketing the scarp. Uh, this one's a, a, a sand dike. And then in this case, it's, drawn as a sill, so it injected subsurface. It wasn't erupted. It was actually below the surface, but shallow, so it deformed the ground. 
And so the event horizon is actually up here where there's angular unconformity. So angular unconformity is a very good piece for quick evidence because it means that these layers were tilted and then eroded and then deposition occurred. So then the final and one of our best pieces of evidence is a fissure. So fissure means a hole that opened during the earthquake. Sediment goes into it and then it's then that sediment is buried. So the event horizon is at the level of the fissure. So this is the cartoon of the kinds of evidence that we see. So A profile has two cracks that come to the surface. But as we go across B, you see there's there's only one crack at the surface, but the the A fault, so fault one is continuing in the subsurface. And then fault three is also continuing in the subsurface. So if you just looked at B, you'd say, oh yeah, it's two earthquakes, right? We have one that's down here and one at the surface. But that would be wrong because it's only one earthquake. It's just that the, we say the tip lines of the fault are plunging. And so when you cut across the, the central zone, you get these subsurface tip lines. And so that's why we always have caution about upper termination, that it's a lower quality piece of evidence. It's still useful, but you're always cautious because maybe this happened, right? Okay, so now I'll show an ex an ex a few examples. So this is a big sag pond. And this is a place called Hog Lake. So this is where Gayatri's uh, advisor, he's uh, ex in this is his place. So here it's wet. So you see it's uh, not a good place to trench. But they pumped it and also the climate changed a little bit. And so they dried it out. But because this sed sedimentation here is low energy lake environment, the stratigraphy was excellent to record earthquakes. So they dug many trenches, 1986, 2002, 2004, and here's some trench. So you see here it's drier. And you see the alluvial fan is coming in. So what they're looking for is the inner fingering, if possible, between the alluvial fan sediments, which would be pebbles, with the lake sediments, which would be silts or uh, organic layers. And so here, look at this very rich structure. So it also shows the style of logging, very detailed objective logging on photo mosaics. And so, so, uh, this one, it's, it's amazing. It took like many people five years to do this project, at least five, but I know, uh, you know, maybe five or six people worked over those five years so lots of labor and and then you know rockwell he was the boss but uh every one of these little yellow things is an earthquake level so if you look we'll look in detail at a few of them but for example this e6 you can see this unconformity over this complex deformation right and then you see here is e6 also so one of the nice things about the this fine stratigraphy is it's possible to correlate. And so you could accumulate evidence for ruptures at these different stratigraphic levels. And so able to build a, a kind of a, a list of evidence for each earthquake. Here's a deep kind of a fissure and unconformity. The disk is obviously younger than these. So going on and on, here's a maybe a one where we can start you see E1 is breaks the surface, probably the most recent earthquake. E2 is somehow going across and breaks this layer, but then does not appear to break this one. Then you see E3, I think he's showing as a, a change in thickness. This fold occurred in E3, but then these layers are onlapping. And so, you know, this layer is not as folded as this one. But then the layer was folded in E2, so there's some folding there. E4, you see, it's an upper termination, so we have to be cautious. But E4 seems to show a strong juxtaposition that's covered by this layer. E5, 
upper termination against these these guys. E6 looks like a fissure, so some kind of a hole that was formed. But you see E6 goes above E7, which was there. E7.5, so he found another event, had to put it between uh, 7 and 8. But then you notice there's no 8, there's only 9. So it's because E8 evidence is somewhere else in the exposures, but he built a complete stratigraphic model for the site. And so you could find, oh yeah, E8 comes over and it's between these layers. And you notice the layer numbering 225, 204, 200. So he has a very rich stratigraphic correlation across the site and so on. So that's this one. Here's a now remember we talked about benching. Remember Jessica's asking about benching. So here's a, a 2002 was shallow and then they dug deeper in 2004. So this is a uh, let's see this is a meter right here. So so this is one, two, three, four, like a five meter deep record. But it took took a bench, actually two years. So they dug this. Two years later, they cut dug this one. But they could kind of find where it matched in the photography. So you see this uh, layering going across there. So what's really impressive about a record like this one is there can be as many as, he said, 16 earthquakes in this record. So this starts to be really useful for us when we study earthquake recurrence because you can speak more about real averages, right, and variation from average, whereas if you have three earthquakes, two intervals, the average isn't so meaningful, right, if you just have two measurements. But if you have 16 earthquakes and 15 intervals, that starts to become uh, maybe more useful, right, when you test models about recurrence. So sometimes you start to hear these, they'll talk about deep records or long records. They don't mean just deep in terms of the the depth of the excavation, they mean deeper in time. This one's a, I think five, five or six. Each, this is a meter across and then a meter this way. So between the strings is a meter. Hmm? Yeah, each picture that is a half meter tall by a meter wide. So this, the grids are one meter by one meter. Okay, so we need to find one of these here, right? Somewhere. Let's keep looking. Because of the lake, you know, and it's a good place because it's not bioturbated. So there's enough water keeps the animals out, and there wasn't that much vegetation to have roots to destroy the stratigraphy either. So, so that's a, a, a timing story. So 16 earthquakes, but you don't have any idea really of the amount of slip in each earthquake. We just know it's ground deformation, right? So that's key problem for many studies is we don't know slip per event. But slip per event for 16 earthquakes is quite difficult. Although you saw from sometimes the geomorphology, we can get a sequence from the land surface, but at depth it's difficult. But here's a subsurface study where they tracked a single channel. So this is a map, and the channel comes in to the fault zone, and it's offset once, then again to here, then again to there, to there, to there, and then it doesn't appear in T3. I don't know where it went. Um, so so they, and here's what it looks like from the air. They used a balloon to take a picture of this site. So they're basically, this is called 3D trenching. So you're trying to find a feature that's buried, like a channel, and track it across the site. And so here's the reconstruction. So they were, they took the offset sequence and they, they flipped it back. And so they get 8.7 meters of offset on this channel. So then if you know the age of the channel, you get a slip rate. It's not saying how many earthquakes are there, however. It just says offset. Q. 
cumulative offset, multiple earthquakes probably. But it shows the strategy. So this is a much more complex uh, trenching project because you need to have multiple trenches and you're you're really tracking the feature. So you're looking for the channel bottom, let's say, in, in the walls on either side. And so usually you'll do uh, lots of surveys. So we'll survey the in 3D each time you encounter the channel. You can track it. So, for example, in July, Gayatri and I will go to California to do a study like this. And we'll, we'll dig. You see here, it was... Uh, you know, one wall, two wall, three wall, and then a gap to here. But what we may do is, is they call shaving the walls. You'll dig the trench, expose the channel, and then go back just 20 or 30 centimeters, cut the wall out, remove the material, look at the channel, survey it, cut the wall out, do another. So you progressively expose the channel in these slices. And then you can track it across. And then if you find a fault, so we'll need some fault locator trenches like this one and this one so we know, you know, as we're, we're, you know, we know where the faults are and as we're cutting, shaving, we know when we're getting close to a fault so we can try to watch for the offset across. So 3D trenching is a powerful tool but usually quite a labor intensive. Here was a, the outcome of a detailed study and here's what their trench logs look like. So this is a place called Wrightwood. It's on the San Andreas Fault uh, here, so near Los Angeles. And it's a place where the, rec the earthquake record is really another one of these really long, deep time records. But they also have a sense of what the slip was in each earthquake based on a reconstruction of the the deformation of these blocks that they, they're cutting. So they spent many years, this is probably a 15 year project and several people working every year for many years and doing their PhDs. So this is Sharer, she's a USGS scientist now, but her PhD was on this site. And so you can see here, um, I'll show, we'll look at this this afternoon. You can see one event, you see this offset there comes and there's no evidence there, so it's just buried here. And then if you look at this black, it looks like there's more offset than the gray, so it's probably an earthquake between there. Here's an offset, look at this black under the gray, so there's an event there. So they basically did many, many studies, so I'm just, showing, and many trenches, that's uh, trench 35. So they may have, um, obviously, at least 35 trenches. And sometimes, so the the boss of this project is named Weldon, Ray Weldon, and he, uh, I call the Weldon rule, and he says it's, you have to have at least one trench per earthquake. So, it, so if you want, you know, you have uh, three or four earthquakes, you need to have three or four trenches. And his point is that you won't have lots of evidence. And so you keep checking and checking. And if you, you have a trench design where you have one trench and then a connector and another, you can track the stratigraphy around. So you basically expose lots of surface area and you can build your evidence. So they have at least 35 trenches, but they have um, not, so, not as many earthquakes. They maybe have... Uh, 15 or so earthquakes, I forget how many, but they have lots of redundancy in their observations. So they're very uh, well characterized. And so they can color code the earthquakes by the quality. So is it an exceptional earthquake or average or below average? And then these red, these, these curves actually come from OxCal. So remember when we did our exercise and we were computing the probability distribution of the age of the earthquake. So you, so what they don't show here is all the radiocarbon dates that went into this. And so they're just showing the constrained dates of each earthquake. Okay. So what this shows is that the ages of the events and their quality. So they know two historic earthquakes and then they have these other guys going back. 
And then they have this gap in their stratigraphy that causes problems for them. And all they know is there's probably about five earthquakes in there. And then they have a deep section that, you know, starting 3,500 years ago, so 1500 BC, there's another good section. So, but with this sequence, they have a really an earthquake time series. And so here's, for example, their stratigraphy, their age model. So they have many, many dates. And so you can imagine this is a very complex Oxcal model, but really rich. And there, the site has good sand, but also these black things are peat, so organic rich layers. And so the, remember I've talked about the diversity of the stratigraphy. There's a lot of different facies there, different layer types. And so they get good resolution. So it's some sand, some peat, not just only sand or only peak. And so here's what they, this might be easier to look here. So they uh, have time, the last, this is basically the upper sequence. So this is coming from this group of earthquakes. And they think they know how much slip there was in each earthquake. And so what you can see is this doesn't, this is not, uh, characteristic. So there's some small guys and 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 then it goes up. So we don't see this real complete relaxation. You know, so the, the blue would show the inner size of extreme accumulation. And instead of a simple model where you, you accumulate the strain and then you release it back down to zero and then you go back up to another one. So simple model. This one's complex where we have you know small earthquake accumulate some strain, another small earthquake that doesn't relax everything that's accumulated, then a series of bigger ones that really burn up that strain, and then we start to accumulate again. So this kind of shows us probably more realistic how earthquake sequences are instead of our simple model. And it only is coming from these really uh, complete earthquake time series. And so they even can show that it looks like the fault slip rate changed. So there was a period here when this group of many earthquakes occurred that were kind of big. That was this time when the slip rate was actually pretty high, as much as eight centimeters a year. And then over in this period since then, it was kind of more back to 2.4. And we know the long-term rate is something between those two. So this is a really powerful characterization of the behavior of the, the faulting of this changing rate, short-term slip rate. So then what they were able to do is test these ideas of slip predictable and time predictable. And so what the idea of a slip predictable one would be to say, well, the length of the time of the previous intersizement period should indicate how much earthquake to expect how much slip to expect. So if you have a long intersizement period, you should expect a larger amount of slip and short. And so here they're just plotting the data and it, it doesn't really follow the slip predictable model. A group does, but a group does not. And then here's the time predictable, which is kind of the opposite. It says, well, you know, the amount of slip that you have in, in an earthquake would kind of suggest how much time until the next earthquake. So that's this length of, of you know, one meter, and let's say this is the earthquake displacement and the length of subsequent interseismic period. So it's time predictable. And then also the data don't really follow it. So it shows that neither the slip predictable nor the time predictable model explain the actual data very well because of the maybe complex behavior of the fault zone. And one thing about this site is that it's it's in the San Andreas, right in a place where there's a, a number of faults coming in. San Jacinto and San Andreas are joining, and there's a thrust fault nearby. So one thing that might be causing complexity in the earthquake recurrence is fault interaction. So it might be better to go up here, where like in the Carrizo Planar, where it's more isolated, single fault by itself. It might behave more simply. So in a sense, I don't want you to be depressed to say, oh, you know, slip predictable, time predictable doesn't work where we haven't made any progress. The earthquake science is, you know, just hopeless. It's just that 
challenging. But it, it, uh, this place might not be the best place to test these models because of the fault complexity. So that's the story for this lecture.